there was a young woman who wanted to attend a certain college. So she began to fill out the application form for the college. But when she came across this question, her heart sank. The question was, are you a leader? Being honest and conscientious, she wrote no as her answer. She then went about filling out the rest of the application and mailed it off, but she wasn't very hopeful. A couple months later, she received the following response from the college. Dear applicant, a study of the application forms reveals that this year, our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel that it is an imperative that they have at least one follower. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk to you about being a follower and a leader of Jesus as a disciple. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, otherwise known as the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus sees potential disciples he calls upon them to put down everything and to follow him, and just like that, that is what they do. But in John's gospel, who should not be confused with John the baptizer, it's quite different. Incidentally, as you may recall, the reason I call John John the baptizer rather than John the Baptist is because John was Jewish. He wasn't Baptist. Upon seeing the approach of Jesus, the day after baptizing him, John calls out to all who can hear, saying, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's a rather peculiar thing to say, don't you think? What does that mean? The Jewish faithful would have recognized what that meant, however. They would have recognized that Jesus, he must be some sort of spotless pure sacrificial lamb on which sins can be placed and then they will be forgiven by God. John, as I will call him now, then testifies to his disciples that Jesus does not merely baptize with water as he does, but he also baptizes with the Holy Spirit, for he is the Son of God. Now we tend to think of John as being a rather strange, rough and rugged individual who ate grasshoppers, ate wild honey, clothed himself in camel's hair. But the fact is also true that John had a large following. People from all walks of life, including the rich and powerful, would go out to hear John preach and to be baptized with and by John. John was indeed a leader who had disciples of his very own, and this day, we find him with two of his disciples, and John saw it as his mission to, as he puts it himself, prepare the way of the Lord. And literally, John also saw it as his job to point out who the Messiah was. The day after that story, he is again with a couple of his disciples, and they are on the lookout for Jesus, and upon spotting him, John announces, Look, here is the Lamb of God. John's disciples turn around and they start to follow Jesus. Jesus takes notice of them. But unlike in the synoptic gospels, he doesn't issue the statement, Come and follow me. But rather, Jesus asks them this question. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? A woman in Australia knew exactly what she was looking for. She was looking for a husband, and she wanted everyone to know it. So she rented a very large billboard at a major city intersection, and across the top in very large bold letters, she wrote, Husband Wanted. And then beneath that, she wrote all the specifics of a husband that she was looking for. She listed the preferred height, the weight, the profession, the personality, and so on. This woman knew exactly what she was looking for in the way of a husband. Unlike that woman, however, 
John's two disciples did not know what they were looking for. Quite possibly, Jesus was expecting them to say something along the lines of, we're looking for the Messiah. But that was not their response. No, these two men say, uh, er, um, Jesus, where are you staying? Not exactly the, shall we say, theological geniuses that genius may have preferred. But instead of telling them to hit the road, Jesus says to them, come and see. The two men take Jesus up on his offer. They go and not only take a peek and stay with Jesus just for a couple minutes, they remain there with Jesus for the rest of the day. Can you imagine hanging out with Jesus at his place? I wonder, what was his place like? Was it tidy? Remembering the old saying, cleanliness is next to godliness after all. Or was Jesus' place rather messy? After all, he had many other things he had to be about doing. I wonder, what did he serve them in the way of refreshments? Remembering that Jesus, later on in life, would go on to take ordinary water and turn it into the best wine anyone has ever tasted. Most of all, I wonder, what was it the three of them talked about? The answer is, we don't know. But the experience must have been absolutely amazing, for we read, one of the two who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother and said to him, we have found the Messiah. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now, let's try to unpack all of what we have just heard. Two of John's disciples leave him in order to become disciples of Jesus. I wonder, how did John feel about that? After all, he put all this time, work, and effort into making these disciples. But let us not forget, John is a great follower of the ways of God. His heart is filled with love, and that is the purpose for which he lived. Remembering in 1 Corinthians 13, we read, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist upon its own way. We can be sure that John actually felt honored that Jesus would recruit two of his disciples to be two of Jesus' disciples. John was a great leader indeed, but he was also a great follower, which is why he said to people who came to him asking if he was the Messiah, who, me? I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. You know, I cannot help but think again about that woman and her billboard. She thought she knew her ideal husband the love of her life, what he would be all about. Whether or not she ever found him, I don't know. But the two disciples, they had no preconceived notions whatsoever about who it was they were looking for. They were counting on, if you will, non-romantic love at first sight in order to identify the Messiah. And John, he helped them to do just that. Unlike romantic love, which can be protective and jealous, after meeting Jesus, the two now former disciples of John find their experience of meeting Jesus to be so amazing that they can't keep Jesus to themselves. They have to go out and tell others. Again, right away, Andrew goes off and tells his brother Simon. And he then introduces Simon to Jesus, who, as we heard, Jesus, upon seeing, sees so much potential in Simon that he renames him Peter, which means the rock, the rock upon whom Jesus would build his church. I wonder, how did Andrew feel about that? After all, sibling rivalry and all that sort of thing. For Jesus, well, he didn't change Andrew's name. Perhaps his parents got it right on that name. 
Some consider it as John's destiny to be in the shadow of Jesus. And some consider it as Andrew's destiny to be in the shadow of Peter. But I think it's clear that John and Andrew were great leaders and followers of the faith, and they both played very vital roles. It is true that Andrew would never become one of Jesus' prominent disciples. In fact, he is only mentioned in the New Testament 13 times. And in eight of those 13 times, he is referred to as being Simon Peter's brother, who is mentioned 151 times. Indeed, Simon Peter the Rock was the rock star of Jesus' disciples. But his brother Andrew, the first of Jesus' disciples, was also his very first evangelist. Andrew, as a follower of Jesus, had such a loving heart that he willingly shared the relationship he had with Jesus with all who desired it as well. That, my friends, is unselfish leadership. We don't possess a great deal of knowledge about Andrew, but we know all we need to know about his character. There are only three times in the Gospels in which Andrew is at the center stage of the stories. And in each of those stories, Andrew is introducing other people to Jesus. We've already heard the first incident from John chapter 1. The second incident takes place in John chapter 6, in which Jesus is about to preach to a huge crowd of people. But before doing so, he figures that they must be very hungry. What is, do his disciples suggest? They say to him, well, let them fend for themselves. Send them off to get some food and have them all come back. They suggest this, all of them, except for Andrew. Andrew goes off into the crowd and he finds a little boy. This little boy must have been the first century equivalent of a boy scout because he brought his lunch. His lunch consists of some bread and a couple of fish. Andrew then introduces this boy to Jesus. And through that boy, Jesus is able to feed thousands. Just imagine being that boy. Now, scholars disagree to this very day about the nature of that miracle. But the point not to be missed is that all were fed simply because Andrew introduced a boy to Jesus. Andrew's act reminds us of how important children and the resources are to Christ and Christ's church. Andrew's act shows us how crucial it is for us in our words and our deeds to bring children into the presence of Jesus. If we don't care enough to pass on the faith to children, then the Christian faith will be only one generation away from extinction. And the third incident in which Andrew introduces people to Jesus takes place in John chapter 12, in which a group of Greeks approach Philip, another one of Jesus' disciples, saying, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Well, it would seem that Philip, he didn't know what to do, perhaps because these people were strangers, they're from another land. And so what does he do? He goes off and tells Andrew. Andrew, however, knows exactly what to do. He goes to Jesus and then goes about making the introductions. Why? Because it would seem that Andrew knows that for each and every person, a relationship with Jesus is possible. Some of you are uncomfortable with bringing people to Jesus introducing them to the Christian faith. Meanwhile, it's a fact of church life that the vast majority of people who come to church do so because a family member or a friend invited them. Rather ironic, don't you think? If we did invite more people more often to church, our churches would be jammed full of people filled with people wanting to worship God, to hear the gospel message, to be prepared to go out into the world and be disciples of Christ, carrying on Jesus' work. That is what the studies show. 
And yet, we hesitate. Andrew introduced Jesus, excuse me, perhaps the reason we hesitate is that in order to share our faith, we figure that we have to be like Peter, a rock star, a superstar. But the fact is, most of us are not superstars. But that doesn't mean, friends, we can't make a significant contribution. The message for is that the most important thing we can have is a loving, welcoming heart like Andrew. Here's another amazing fact that may surprise you. Andrew is the patron saint of no fewer than three very different countries, Russia, Greece, and Scotland. Again, Andrew is not known as being one of Jesus' superstar disciples. He is not even known to have preached a sermon, but he knew Jesus and he introduced other people to Jesus in very ordinary, welcoming words and by living a life of loving discipleship. The following is a story which was shared with a minister by one of his parishioners. The parishioner shared with his minister that his brother was a very wealthy man, and his brother had given him a beautiful, luxurious car, fully loaded with all the extras for his birthday. He then went on to say that one day, oh, about four or five days after he received the car, he came downstairs from his office in order to get into his new car, when he spotted a boy checking out his car. When he approached the car to get in, the boy said, Mr. Is this your car? Yes, it is, said the man. Wow, said the little boy. How much did it cost? Why, it didn't cost me a thing, said the man. My brother gave it to me. Really, said the little boy. Your brother gave you this car? I wish. And then the man said to his minister, I knew what the little boy was going to say. I knew he was going to say, I wish I had a brother like that who would give me such a car. But that is not what the little boy said. What the little boy said was, I wish that I could be a brother like that. Andrew introduced Jesus to his brother Simon who would go on to be the first leader of the church, and the world was forever changed. Do you wish that you could be a brother or a sister like that? Andrew introduced Jesus to a boy, and through that boy, Jesus would carry out one of his greatest miracles, and the world would be forever changed. Do you wish that you could be welcoming to children like that? Andrew introduced Jesus to from some strangers from another land. And we can surmise that those strangers, when they returned back to their home country, told others about Jesus. And the world was forever changed. Do you wish that you could be as welcoming to strangers as that? My friends, if those are your wishes, I hope that I convince you that they can come true. And through you, God's wishes will come true. Amen.